why is it so hard to find someone to help me? Why does everyone just not even believe this is real? I, I, I can't even imagine, honestly, like, I, I do not know how this is gonna end. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today we're picking up on my SIBO journey with a little update on where I'm currently at. But first, let me tell you about my sponsor, BetterHelp. So as you guys know, I have struggled with anxiety my whole life and getting my mental health under control is actually a really important part of my gut healing journey since the brain and gut are so intimately connected. So I recently discovered BetterHelp, which is the world's largest online therapist network with over 20,000 licensed professional therapists. It's not a crisis line or a self-help Helpline. It's professional therapy done securely anywhere, anytime online. So basically you can log into your account anytime to send a message to your therapist and get a timely response. So you don't need to wait weeks between appointments when maybe you're dealing with something very pressing or time sensitive. It's also a lot more affordable than traditional in-person therapy. And there's also financial aid available to those in need. So if you're struggling with your mental health, check out betterhelp.com slash Abby's Kitchen to get 10% off of your first month of therapy. That's better H E L P. And you can join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. All right, back to my video. Now, before we get too into it, please pause the screen to check out my disclaimer, including a reminder that my SIBO protocol is mine and mine alone. Please do not try to attempt this. Always speak to a registered dietitian or a healthcare provider about your unique needs. Now, in case you guys don't know, a quick little recap. Back at the beginning of 2021, I was diagnosed with SIBO and SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now, there are a lot of potential causes of SIBO. Um, most people tend to get it from a really bad bout of food poisoning. But in my case, it's theorized that I actually got it from doing four rounds of antibiotics from having back-to-back -back cases of mastitis five times. Not three, not four. When I was pumping for baby E. Now, I tried to treat it earlier this year, and while I felt amazing during treatment, unfortunately, my treatment and medication options were limited because I was breastfeeding, so it just was not strong enough to eradicate it for good. Now that I've weaned, the bitch is back, back, streets, back all right. and I'm gonna kill that mother bacteria. So let me take you along on my journey. Yeah love that journey for me. First, we need a baseline, and that means doing the god-awful SIBO breath test again. If you remember from my last video, this means two whole days of eating nothing but chicken, eggs, white rice, white bread, oil, and clear broth. No fiber, no spices, no coffee. F my life kill me. So to prepare, I did some meal prepping and I made some big batches of chicken and big batches of rice and broth. So for two days, I had toast with eggs for breakfast. I had chicken and rice in broth with some bread for lunch. And then I had some rice with chicken and bread for dinner. Creative, I know. But I was just desperate to get through that damn test. And so we meet again. Well, let's do this. That does not feel like it's working. I hope I did that right. One eternity later. <sighs> That's so good. That tastes like so good today. Oh, I also just wolfed down an entire container of cantaloupe. So that went down. Um, and I am having a peach and some yogurt and some mini muffins and some crackers as a pre-lunch snack because I kind of skipped breakfast. So yeah, just warming up for lunch. And it's gonna be a good day. Gonna be a good day today. That's not a real song. 
All right, let me drink my coffee. One week later. Okay, so I just got an email with the results from my SIBO test and not surprisingly, based on my symptoms, it's still positive. <gasps> Um, and it's still positive for the methanogenic bacteria, which is what I had predominantly last time, though just based on symptomology, there's also a little bit of suspicion that I also have some hydrogen bacteria as well. And actually this time it's even a little bit worse, which apparently is not uncommon with stubborn methanogenic bacteria. It can be really hard to treat and fully eradicate. So the plan here is that I'm gonna start a new biofilm disruptor. This is what they call like a phase two biofilm disruptor because it's a little bit more aggressive than the NAC that I took with my first two rounds of antibiotics. So I'm taking something called bismuth thiol complex. Bismuth? I don't know how to say that. Bismuth thiol clump. Bleh, bleh. Bismuth. My name is Sammy. They call me Sammy Sprinkler. Thiol. Complex. I feel like I have to have a lisp in order to say that. Um, and I have to take it for two months, which sucks because I really just want this whole phase to be over with and to, to be on the other side of feeling great and recovered. But here we are. And now that I have come to the end of my breastfeeding journey, I can finally start to take that. So I guess we're gonna have to see how this goes. So I am very, very frustrated this week. I'm having a hard time getting the, you know, appropriate protocol prescribed to me, like to actually get the medication. So basically, in short, the challenge is that rifaximin is the kind of go-to evidence-based antibiotic for treating SIBO. You would basically, you know, everyone takes rifaximin if they're gonna do the antibiotic route. And I took that, two doses of it, but the evidence suggests that we actually wanna pair it with another antibiotic to really eradicate the SIBO. And the type of SIBO that I have, methanogenic dominant, um, best practice for that is to pair the rifaximin with something called neomycin, which is another antibiotic. Now here in Canada, neomycin has what we call like a black box warning. So that means that it comes with um, the risk of some potentially dangerous side effects. In the case of neomycin, those side effects are things like deafness, um, like ringing your ears, C, de C. diff, um, infection, etc. Not surprisingly, a lot of doctors are very hesitant to prescribe it. And in fact, you can't even buy it at a regular pharmacy. You actually have to have it compounded because it's just very infrequently prescribed because it is potentially dangerous. Now, the evidence suggests that some of these terrible side effects are actually seen with long-term use and an IV use, not so much in these really short durations of use, like what you would be doing with SIBO, but still, understandably, it freaks a lot of physicians out. And since a lot of doctors don't actually know a whole lot about SIBO, and in fact, a lot of physicians and, and healthcare professionals don't even acknowledge that SIBO is a real thing, um, they're understandably hesitant to prescribe anything that comes with these significant risks. So I've now spoken to three different doctors and nobody will prescribe me the drugs. And there's no point in me doing another round of rifaximin because I've done it twice and we've seen from my SIBO results and repeating them that it didn't work. It just came back. And in fact, it came back a little bit worse. And I actually spoke to a bunch of my RD colleagues from different provinces in Canada and the States. And it seems that, you know, Ontario seems to be a little bit behind in our understanding of SIBO, um, and which is strange to me because the tests are run out of, you know, Ontario and Toronto's major hospital, Mount Sinai. I even called Cedar sinai which is in LA, where um, the doctor there is kind of like the, the godfather of SIBO, but they were willing to take me on as a patient, but they'd only see me in person, not virtually. And honestly, I can't just fly to LA to get a prescription. So this has been a humbling experience and definitely evidence that, you know, there's definitely some challenges and gaps in our healthcare system. It's an amazing healthcare system and I'm so grateful for it and I'm so grateful for free healthcare here in Canada, but you know, it's not without its challenges in getting timely, effective care sometimes. So anyways, I'm gonna keep pressing on and just hoping I can find a healthcare professional who will help. I'm so frustrated. I'm just so 
mad and, and nervous that I'm gonna go through this whole exercise of even taking this biofilm disruptor, which is an expensive medication to begin with, and I'm not gonna have anyone to support me in this journey. Like you would not believe how many people, how many dietitians, colleagues of mine that I've spoken to who have had SIBO or have SIBO or who deal with patients who have SIBO every day and they cannot find practitioners and, and doctors to support their care. Why does nobody believe this is real? Like we have a diagnostic tool run out of Canada's top hospital. And while the specificity isn't perfect, you know, in the hands of a skilled practitioner, it's a pretty great tool. It is just so archaic that, you know, so many doctors are just dismissing this as naturopathic woo. We have research on this. We have research suggesting that like six to 15% of asymptomatic healthy people are affected by SIBO and that it could be as high as like 70 to 80% of people with IBS. You would think that with those kind of numbers, every research lab and pharmaceutical company would be clamoring to find a foolproof cure, you know? <sighs> I'm normally so proud to be part of the evidence-based wellness community, but it's times like these I fully understand why people need to seek out alternative practitioners or healthcare when there's so much friggin' red tape to even people acknowledging when there's a problem. <sighs> I feel so let down by the system. It should not be making me more sick to try to get better. Okay, so update. I was finally able to find a doctor who's well-versed in methanogenic SIBO to help me, you know, prescribe the right protocol so that I can really just like put this to bed and finish this off and do it right. So she was very helpful, of course, but she also scared the living out of me because she made it very clear that she really could only prescribe the neomycin once. Um, and that of course is to help reduce the risk of any of the dangerous side effects and antibiotic resistance. So basically what she told me was that if I didn't go kind of all in on this and literally do everything in my power to eradicate um, the bacteria this round, that I may have no other option but to do the elemental diet. And that is literal torture. And I'm not sure I'm mentally prepared for that. Like it's literally a diet of amino acids to help starve off the bacteria for two weeks. I mean, all of this is about weighing, you know, the risks and benefits. And I'm not sure that the benefits outweigh the risk to my mental health especially as somebody who came from an eating disorder background. Like there are a lot of people who I would say the elemental diet is contraindicated for, and I'm just gonna throw myself in there and say, yeah, not for me. Because I wanna do this properly, I reached out to two of my colleagues who specialize in SIBO um, to really help review my protocol and offer any other evidence-based tips or suggestions when it comes to supplements uh, throughout this journey. Well, I spoke to Diane Rishikoff, who's actually written a book about this. Um, I'm gonna link to that below. And then Anya Rosen as well, two amazing practitioners. So I'm gonna link to their websites below. So in case you're struggling with SIBO yourself, and you'd like some one-on-one -on -one support, they know their stuff. But this is really my, again, disclaimer, that my protocol is unique to me, it's unique to my numbers, it's unique to my particular type of SIBO. Um, so as always, do not just copy what I'm doing ever. That can be dangerous. Always speak to a registered dietitian like Anya, like Diane, uh, for a personalized protocol for yourself. So I just got off the phone with two colleagues of mine back to back who are of course so helpful. And there seems to be some solid consensus here on what I need to do in order to give myself the best chance of success. And I have to say that, you know, I'm a professional and even I feel so overwhelmed with everything that like I have to do and I have to buy and I have to get and, it's like, you know, 
it's I'm a little stressed out over it so much so that I was feeling quite queasy. I had all the digestive distress following the call. Anatomy like lava, which is generally what happens when I feel anxious. But yeah, once you get into the world of functional nutrition, it's like you're unpeeling this never ending onion. There's just so much to unpack and none of it is black and white. There isn't like a gold standard here for treatment and a lot of it is, you know, trial and error and it's grounded in more clinical experience and in science, but not actually really good quality research yet. And that's honestly just because the research hasn't caught up yet. Um, not in the pharmaceutical world and definitely not in the world of nutrition and lifestyle recommendations and herbs and supplements or anything like that. I really think we're on the cusp of knowing so much more about the gut microbiome and SIBO specifically and like give it five years and doctors are going to be diagnosing SIBO daily and we're going to have a lot more evidence to support the use of specific protocols. Right now for the most part, Part, this is really just like a risk benefit analysis every step of the way. So the way I feel about SIBO and nutrition or supplements is a lot like how I felt when I was going through IVF and infertility. Like the online infertility and IVF community is huge and they're very vocal about, oh, you know, take this specific supplement, this helped me conceive or cut this food out of your diet or don't have caffeine or don't have alcohol or make sure you're having a pineapple a day or whatever. And like with SIBO recommendations, a lot of these things aren't necessarily grounded in research or really heavily evidence-based. A lot of the recommendations might be based more on like the role of a nutrient or a supplement in isolation, but how much of those things or exactly how well they're going to improve outcomes in real life, for the most part, we might not know. And in a lot of cases, I would argue, or at least I would bet that they probably don't make a huge impact in isolation. But you know what does have a huge impact on health outcomes? your mind, especially when it comes to gut health. Like your mental state has a huge impact on your physical well-being, especially when it comes to the brain gut access. So this is a really big connection when it comes to kind of gut and digestive health. I know when I was going through IVF as evidence-based as I was, my doctor offered for me to be part of basically an experiment, um, an experimental procedure. There was no studies on it, no research papers written about it. Nothing had been presented at conferences about it. I was patient number nine. And guess what? In that case, it worked out for me. It gave me my son when the reality is I was told that probably nothing else was going to work. So when I say something doesn't have evidence to support it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't work or you shouldn't try it, but you do need to weigh out the risks and benefits of these kinds of things and ask yourself some really important questions. Can I afford this? Will this procedure or a supplement make me feel more stressed or make me feel more in control even if it's just a placebo? Are there physical risks to my health by doing it? Are there emotional or mental health risks? Will this impact my relationship with food or my relationship with others in a negative way? Will I be upset if I try this and it doesn't work? Or will I be upset if I don't try this and it doesn't work? These are all questions that I need to ask myself on the regular here. Is this how I like to do business when it comes to my health? No, I like to see a list of all benefits and no downfalls, no cons. And there are some things that are definitely holding me back from jumping all in, mainly a fear of making myself emotionally crazy and it being all for nothing. Like I'm gonna have to make myself a schedule right now with all the different medications and supplements and when I have to take them and set alarms on my phone because some things need to be taken twice a day, sometimes three times a day. Some of them have to be taken before meals, with meals, separated. It's gonna be overwhelming for me. It's a lot for me to think about having to prioritize my schedule all of a sudden when I'm so used to prioritizing O's schedule and E's schedule and my husband's schedule and mine just having to like fit in somewhere. Plus, I don't wanna have to cut foods out of my diet. I don't wanna have to think about food that much. I don't want to obsess over food. I'm worried this could trigger some very dark thoughts. I just really hope that it works. So stay tuned for my SIBO eradication protocol and my shocking results. And please leave me a comment if you have any questions.